Well, hi. Um, welcome to another installment on the people side of digital transformation. Um, today, I want to be focusing on how do we define the success and measure the success of the transformation that, as an organization, we want to undergo. And to this end, um, I'd like to use uh, a particular framework today, and that is uh, the balanced scorecard, which is quite an old management tool. But to me, it is a framework that captures um, metrics that matter, um, which to me is really key in terms of helping an organization focus um, its digital transformation and communicate very clearly to its constituents what um, the objectives of the digital transformation are and um, how it's going. Um, one of the things that we learn about um, in the space of digital transformation is the importance of experimentation. And so the experimentation has to be coupled with some kind of stability. And so I really feel that the balanced scorecard is a way of establishing this stability of um, the certainty of knowing, you know, what it is we're trying to achieve, even if our metrics might change over time um, in terms of how we assess whether, in fact, we're achieving our goals. So um, uh, one of the things I think is, is interesting is that um, the balanced scorecard, again, has been around for a while, um, but its, um, its place in the scope of management tools um, has shifted in the last couple of years. So originally, um, when I say originally, this was in uh, 2006. Um, so this is a survey that's done um, by uh, Bain and Company on a regular basis, uh, an international survey of executives who essentially assess the value of um, various management tools. And so the balanced scorecard in 2006, you know, low satisfaction, relatively high usage. Fast forward, what we see is that um, the balanced scorecard, certainly around 2010, uh, made it into the top 10 and stayed there for a number of years. Um, of late, it seems to have diminished again. Um, I've not been able to find more recent um, surveys. So um, my sense is that it's exactly because of the availability of data, um, the increasing pace of decision making, um, that um, uh, you know the balanced scorecard has has come to the fore as a useful tool, because what it does do is it cuts through the noise. It highlights the metrics that ma matter, um, and matter specifically with regard to strategy. So I think one of the most powerful aspects of the balanced scorecard is again its ability to bring executives together in terms of. Um, putting a stake in the ground in terms of um, these are the objectives we're trying to meet um, and then uh, communicating that throughout the organization in terms of the measures that get watched, right? What gets measured gets watched. I think the balanced scorecard has to be adapted um, in order to really make sense in the space of the digital transformation, especially if we're interested in the people side of digital transformation. It's an adaptation that has been made for nonprofit organizations, and that is to remove the financial as the top most important dimension uh, to, to maximize in terms of our goals, but instead to move customer up and therefore, you know, move the other remaining um, dimensions up as well and put financials all the way at the bottom, suggesting that it's not the financials we're trying to maximize. We consider the, con uh, the financials a constraint, but the key thing we want to maximize, or the key thing we want to make a difference in is the customer, because that essentially is what digital transformation is about. It is about um, providing customers with new solutions um, that, and to do so by leveraging information technology. Um, so it's moving from a product focus to a customer solution focus. So the customer really is the key to the value proposition. 
of the company. And so this is essentially then what the balance scorecard looks like. Now, another thing that is frequently associated with the balance scorecard, and by the way, the, I, I use the term strategy map, which is sort of what I'm laying out here, right, which is one representation of uh, the balance scorecard. I'm using that and the balance scorecard synonymously. Um, but um, one article or set of articles that I think are very powerful in this regard of digital transformation is how uh, both written uh, by by Cynthia Beath and um, Jeannie Ross at MIT CISA, which is the Center for Information Systems Research. Um, you know, um, one is a book that came out fairly recently, Designed for Digital, um, and where basically uh, Cynthia and Jeannie, you know, together with their colleagues, are identifying, you know, what digital sort of key elements of digital transformation. Um, and so when it comes to the value proposition, because that's really the key thing in terms of um, setting up a, a strategy map, typically there are three value propositions um, that one can choose from. One is operational excellence, one is customer intimacy, and the other one is product leadership. Um, and what uh, you know, the, the research by um, Jeannie and, and uh, colleagues uh, is showing is that you essentially just have two customer value propositions once you move into the digital space or sort of into the space of digital transformation. What falls away is operational excellence. The uh, meaning being that, um, you know, being operationally excellent is table stakes. Um, in order to really differentiate yourself, you either get close to the customer or you innovate on products. And um, what is interesting about, uh, an interesting finding from this research is that irrespective of where you start, it's important to start in one of these two areas to decide we're either going to focus on the customer and work with the customer to identify you know, novel solutions, or we're going to come up with novel solutions and then sell it to the customer or find the appropriate customer. Ultimately, what um, uh, you know, th this research is showing is that irrespective of where you start, you'll end up getting to the other value proposition. So these value propositions are increasingly um, intimately tied. So I think that's an interesting um, thing, uh, sort of interesting aspect to note. Okay, so um, let's just, you know, uh, throw a couple of ideas out here with regard to what would a um, customer value proposition for the people side of, of digital transformation look like. Um, so first of all, um, I thought I'd, I'd use the case by Royal Philips. So Royal Philips, um, you know, a medical device company that sells both to consumers, you know, electric toothbrushes that are now increasingly connected to the internet, um, and um, all sorts of other medical devices, for example, uh, breathing masks for people with sleep apnea and so so on. What Royal Phillips decided in terms of its big, very bold strategy or, or mission um, is to say that they wanted to improve the health of 3 billion people by 2025. Who are these customers? So we've always had consumers as their customer, they've always had those. They've um, also had, um, you know, uh, medical uh, professionals um, and, uh, you know, sort of the medical, uh, sort of medical services providers, if you want. But now as part of building, you know, a platform strategy and connecting multiple constituents that have previously not been connected, and to do so, you know, via analytics and uh, providing value um, via the um, increasing information and the insights we can get from these connected devices across the industry. We can imagine that, you know, insurance companies, you know, are going to be an increasing part of this and possibly third party um, software developers. 
right, software solution developers, um, because uh, that, of course, is a key aspect of a, uh, a platform strategy is to, to have um, a whole host of third party providers. And so what's the value proposition we offer each of those customers? So we might say that for the consumers, um, we're going to offer value proposition of improved health. Um, you know, uh, health or quality of life. Um, because uh, the you know, the less time I need to spend with a doctor, the fewer the incidents of um, uh, impaired health that I experience, right? All of that improves my life. Um, now for the medical professionals, they might, uh, you know, want to use all these services uh, in particular to improve their outcomes, right? Improve health outcomes. Um, insurance companies, most probably very interested in improved profitabilities. And of course, you know, um, we might think of, um, you know, the third party app providers, uh, you know, t again, also to, um, you know, discover new markets. One of the things that um, we certainly learn about um, Royal Phillips is that one of the strategies, um, the way that they thought about this is um, engage in co-design. So one of the things that, um, you know, uh, we, we might want to sort of think about in terms of what business processes do we need to develop or excel at, it's um, co-design solutions, right? Um, and so that could that would be you know something we need to accomplish. Um, so co-design together with our customers, um, and um, so you know in order to do that, um, we would need to uh, or they have needed to um, uh, componentize right sort of div um, oopsie componentize oops this pen is doing weird things um, you know their products. And so, you know, by having these components, what it allows um, the organization to do is essentially then um, assemble, uh, you know, new solutions for the customer. All right. So those would be, let's say, some of the business processes. Now, what does that mean for, um, you know, the people side of the organization? Well, it certainly means, you know, a reorganization. Um, because if we're going to assemble new solutions, right, we need much more cross-functional teams. So, um, so we might uh, say we need training um, in agile uh, development. So, uh, because, you know, in order to do this co-design, we need this agile development methodology to be quick, um, to, you know, experiment, um, to be inclusive, to be cross-disciplinary, right? So um, there are all sorts of um, things that agile offers us that would be helpful in terms of, um, you know, building an infrastructure of flexibility uh, in, in people. Of course, you know, in order to componentize here, um, well, a, a large part of what we need to do is this whole uh, platform and API development. So let's put that over here. So um, API development, right? And um, that would allow us to, you know, support uh, these new markets over here um, and, um, uh, you know, so and and similarly, this would help us, you know, develop and assemble new products potentially. Um, so, um, so the the idea here is 
that by focusing on our customers first and, and sort of getting away from um, the focus on financials um, and, and not letting the financials get in the way or be um, sort of more important than what it is we're trying to do with regard to identifying new value propositions, that that's why we rearrange the strategy map. Um, and um, and then essentially identify the key activities that we might want to achieve or the key ways in which we expect to achieve this strategy. Anyhow, um, I know this is uh, rather messy um, and um, rather fluid, uh, but hopefully it gives you some ideas of how you might go about um, thinking uh, and, and putting onto a single page uh, what the digital transformation is that you're trying to achieve and how you would ascertain whether you're making progress towards this digital strategy and also communicating um, to your constituents um, uh, you know what your goals are and and really putting a stake in the ground in terms of um, being clear in terms of how you want to achieve um, this digital transformation. Anyway, with that, take care.